My name is Philip. Um, I'm a Portuguese architect based in Porto. I'm 34 years old and I studied in Porto, worked in Switzerland, Japan, and started my practice together with Anna and Ahmed seven, eight years ago, around 2013, 14, more or less. And um, since then we have been running a platform uh, where a lot of people have collaborated. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember, uh, I should have been like seven or eight, and I remember that my, because my parents tell me that I was talking about it, that I wanted to be an architect, even if I was not very sure about what an architect really was, but I had some idea of designing houses or something of that kind. Um, and every single step along the way as a kid, you know, the studies you take, the university you choose was based with this idea, on this idea. And I think today I am, I am an architect because of that childish obsession. Um, that, that there's no one in my family that is an architect or an artist or anything like that. I think, I think no, I'm, I'm absolutely sure I'm the first one in the family tree following this option. I was very naive in that sense. I, I wanted to do architecture without really knowing what it was. I did not study art uh, before joining architecture school. I was actually studying math and sciences. And I remember just when I joined the school that at some point, um, well, right from the start, I was bombed with all of these names and I had to catch up with all my colleagues because I felt they know a lot of things I don't. <laughs> and I had no idea who those architects were before uh, joining the school. I was born in Porto uh, in an evening in 1987 and um, I studied my whole life in Porto even if I lived my whole life in the suburbs from Porto. So as a, as a kid and as a teenager I was a daily migrant sleeping in a suburb studying Porto, going back to the suburb, going back to Porto. And my parents, they were both from Porto, Porto, you know, the city center. But when they married, they went to the suburbs and I was uh, an offspring of that uh, suburban um, flux. Um, and I studied in Porto, uh, in Porto School of Architecture, just out of chance. It was the closest faculty to home. So even I think I was very lucky in many moments in my life, and that was one of them. I ended up going to an amazing architecture school out of geographical uh, coincidence. I remember my first year in university. It was quite hard. Every single student that joins the school is, in a way, uh, the best student of his class in high school. You know, like we are all, uh, I would even say, very arrogant because we are truly convinced we were special somehow um, because our system to apply to universities based in grades, numbers, you know, something very abstract, not on motivation. And because of that, everyone there is a bit cocky sometimes. But in just a few months, you are, you know, bombed by reality and you understand that now it's a new league. You know, the level, expectation level is much higher. And in just a few weeks, you understand you are failing all the classes, you are not that good anymore. And I think that's very important for most of us because it's a, a reality check, you know. It puts you back in your place and it grants that you understand that there's something bigger at hand than just the grades you had five years before or so. And I, I knew very little about architecture, as I said. I, I, I was moved by intuition, by kind of childish motivation and when joined when I joined the school I had no references no heroes no anything and the heroes I ended up uh, let's say the gods I created in my mind they came from appropriation of the gods other people around me in the university had to, to share so of course in a few months you understand that there is this guy called Caesar there's this other guy called Sotodemora there's this teacher that did this, this teacher that did that, and then you start to, to kind of compose uh, a mesh of references and names and uh, icons, I would say. And the first two or three years are pretty much about this, about composing a network of, of references. 
course, Caesar is always the one that comes at hand. You know, it's the, first because it's Caesar, <laughs> and second because it's the school of Caesar, and there's a certain lineage and a certain uh, how do you say respect towards his work that is higher than any other value. But at some point, I think around the fourth year, or maybe when you go abroad to study one year in the in another country, you start to understand that this is actually a game, sort of. So there are certain rules, and you actually should not just obey to them. You have to question them. You have to, uh, to a certain time, to a certain point, bend those rules. And I think that's where you start to separate um, the students from the architects. In a way, the moment you understand how the game of architecture is actually bendable. And I think that's something we started to do. And at that point, we started looking at other heroes. Of course, when we worked abroad, we had to look at, you know, people like Herzog and Moho and Sana and, you know, all of those big international firms. And as the, you know, maturity kicks in, you start looking at slightly more uh, refined names like uh, Shinohara, Peter Markley, etc., etc. Caesar is the only constant. We were lucky to have him since the since the start. But I think the references happen like that. At first, you absorb the ones your teachers have to give you. At some point, you understand what is a real architect and what is a smaller architect, let's say. And then at some point, you are already, uh, how do I say this, uh, adult enough to choose the niches in which you want to swim. And um, that's, I think, where we are today. The teacher that had the biggest impact in my education was my second year studio teacher. Um, he's a Porto architect, he's also a student from the school. Of course, a much older student, understands. Um, and he built also a few buildings here in Porto. But I think more than a good architect, he's an outstanding professor. And he's an outstanding professor because more than teaching us about how to draw, that he did, or how to build a model and how to think the project, that he also did, he taught us about the concept of motivation, about how much we should love the discipline, how much this is actually something great because we are architects. And he injected me and the rest of the class, I think, with a, a kind of hormonal architecture, like you want this, you desire this, you cannot live without this. And I think that after my first year, after that kind of plane crash that is the first year for most of us, uh, having this opportunity to have this motivation um, was very, very, very important. And I remember a time where, um, of course, he told this as a joke, but he said that real architecture can only be done at 3 a.m. with a good glass of scotch and prodigy on your headphones. And, you know, then architecture flows and flows and flows. And I'm not too much of a scotch guy, and I'm definitely not a prodigy guy. But I understand perfectly today what he meant at that time. And I'm not a 3 a.m. guy also. So I'm, I'm none of that, but I understand exactly what he meant because I think today we live in that kind of uh, trans mode. My personal history is based off uh, moments of luck, I think. That, you know, being in the right place at the right time and not knowing that's the right place at the right time. Now, remember when I finished my thesis or when I was about to finish it, I saw an application for a scholarship or something like that, and I felt like, yeah, that's the thing I have to do after, right? I finished the thesis and I have to go somewhere. And that application that I never did, I never went for the scholarship, triggered me to do a portfolio and to start applying for internships and to talk with teachers, older teachers, and asking them, where should I go? What's, what's the next step? And a bit by a mix of coincidences and accidents, I ended up going to Basel uh, to work with Harry Guger that had been at HDM for almost 20 years as a partner and he had started his own practice. It was a small practice with big clients, with big projects. So it was a very completely different mindset from the one we had in the school in the sense that the school taught us one way of doing things, one kind of linear trajectory. And there we had 10 architects from 10 completely different backgrounds and nationalities and ages and professional experiences that proved to me that there are 10 ways to do the same thing. And this was the first big lesson. You know, everything we learned was just one possible scenario. There's a lot more to architecture than the scenario we knew. And 
During that year, I had the opportunity to evolve a lot. Uh, I think it was probably the most intense professional experience I had. You know, right out of school, you know, everything is new, but uh, the, the, the expectation and the it, it was a demanding practice. They 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 cared, they taught, but also they expected that we would produce. And after some time, uh, me and Anna moved to to Japan, out of a series of again accidents and coincidences and. To me, that was a bit different. So I was not expecting to have such a intense work experience as I had in Basel, but I was expecting to have a more, how can I say, environmental one. Um, and I applied uh, to work at Sana, and I had a chance to work there for a few months, which in Japanese months means European years because you work too many hours, too many shifts, you don't rest, you, it's, it's a bit of a loop. At some point you don't even know what day it is anymore. But I had a chance in that case not to learn so much but to see a lot of things happening around. So I was um, mostly interested in what was happening around me in the practice and less in what I was doing, even if I was working on quite, a, quite fascinating uh, housing projects. And I think the combination between these two systems plus whatever I had learned in Porto in the school proved to me that, you know, there are three very strong ways to do the same thing. And I like to say that Switzerland is very efficient and organized and all of that. Japan is chaos. But I think the opposite systems are both perfect, you know, like there's something to learn from them. And I think our practice today is informed by, by, by this, by this methodology, method, you know, heavy word from Porto, this kind of efficient, stratific stratified, layered way of working from Switzerland and this kind of chaos from Japan. All of these things, they find a way uh, in our practice here today. The name Fala is just a circumstance. Technically, we could say it started in Japan somewhere in 2013. You know, we could go that way, but I think Fala existed long before when we were doing competitions together, when we were attempting at discussing architecture from a practice perspective. So we had a, we had a, there was an architect in Basel when we were working there that said, we would not be happy until the day we would open our own office because some people have to open their own office and some people have to work nine to five and we wanted a practice. And a couple of years later, well, it actually happened. And I think Fala happened because at some point, no, we did not have a client at that moment, quite the opposite. We had nothing. We had just a lot of ambition, a lot of references, a lot of traveling in our backpacks already. So we had, we had an understanding of what we wanted. We had an understanding of what, uh, you know, we had heroes that worked as references for something that we wanted to achieve. And one day we just decided, okay, let's create a website. Let's, Let's collect everything we did already in this kind of informal manner on the weekends, at night, sometimes working extra hours here and there, and a, a prize here, a prize there, you know, very tiny things. Today they mean nothing, but at the time they meant everything. And we understood that just by stating that we wanted to exist, we existed. And maybe that's the most politically charged gesture we have ever had to define that we wanted to be a practice. And from that moment onwards, we had ups and downs. We had moments with more clients, less clients, with more money, less money, because a practice is still a company and having a company has its challenges also. But I think that very clear understanding that we want to produce our own architecture, whatever that is, is the guiding light um, for us. As a collective practice, um, we are composed of several pixels, so we have different people and of course each one of us has its own private interests. But I would say that for some sort of cosmical coincidence, all of us here have more or less, uh, let's say, a consistent uh, field of interests that guides us towards our teaching positions and the exercises we do in the different schools where we teach. where the practice informs the teaching and the teaching informs the practice. So let's say there's a kind of practical investigation with very young minds. I mean, we are talking about kids that are 20, 21 years old that are contributing to a discussion, even if they know it or not, uh, for our own practice. 
It is also informing some of the texts and, uh, let's say, researches we do on our own. We have a, a very peculiar interest in a certain set of architecture from the 1970s and 80s in Portugal, of uh, what we call them, the ugly ducks, buildings that no one cares about except, I think, the 10 of us. Um, but at the same time, about a very traditional scenario in Japan between 1970, 1980, 1990, where a radical generation of young minds shifted the paradigm of what a house could be. So I think that that, 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 that spectrum from nasty local abandoned buildings to historical examples from Japan uh, shows a certain elasticity, but at the same time we like to draw and to draw not necessarily by hand, not, not the hand sketch from seas or something like that, but the drawing as a form of thinking, be it as a production tool, so to use the drawing to propose and to speculate on how spaces will be organized and traced and how the hierarchies are going to exist between them, but also to draw a posteriori, to look at something that has been done and to reanalyze it, you know, to, to be able to extract from it not just photos and different photos, but also to uh, extract more and more drawings and to discover new tools and to go back to projects we finished five years before and to seeing them something that only now we can fully understand. And we like to photograph also. The idea of documenting the projects, it's very, very, very important for us because as you said, you never visited any of, your, of our projects, but you've seen them. Well, you've seen the photos of those projects, you've seen the drawings of those projects. And when these things come together, we like to believe that the work we do is in a very tiny, small percentage for the client, you know, for that person that is going to live in the house. But in a big percentage, 99% of the, of the work is actually meant to be shared, communicated, spread. And I give an example. There's this generation of architects from the 80s. We never visited their houses because they disappeared in a decade. But we still know them. We like to see our work closer to this condition than to the market that requires houses. You know, like we are not social, we don't have any political agenda of any sort. We just want to do architecture and enjoy doing architecture. So we expect that whatever legacy we leave as a, as a practice, and it's strange to be so young and being talking about a legacy, but whatever the product of our practice is, it's not really the buildings, even if they exist, it's, it's, it's something more. It's something, you know, that goes slightly, just a bit above, that floats above the, the physical constructions. We started teaching because we were invited to teach. Um, we were young and rebel and fresh, so some schools liked that. Most schools don't, but a few, a few liked it. And so we become a kind of prototype of something to be experimented with. And as such, I think we responded to that condition. So our teaching is very often following, you know, the guidelines we were given, so we don't, we don't break schools or anything like that. But um, trying to question uh, where we want to go and where we can take the students to. And most of the exercises we do, they, they learn a lot from that teacher I talked before about this idea of the teacher that motivated me in my second year. And I think that at some point we are not teaching the students any, anything other than you need to like this, you need to enjoy this. And then it becomes automatic, then they look for the information. And we give them, you know, we help them, we teach them how to draw and we tell them which projects to look at and what to see in those projects and how to see each project they look at. But to a large extent, we just accept that it's their role to make their own path, which is very different from what we learned in Porto, where there's one path. And this creates the opportunity for each student to be unique in a way, like to, to, to fall in love with something else than its colleague on the, dex, on the desk next to him. And I think that teaching we do, I mean, most of the times we teach the studio, so we teach, uh, well, project classes. And most of the times I would say the program is irrelevant. Is it a house or a school or a kindergarten? Doesn't matter. 
What really matters to us is that the projects at the end, they have that kind of uh, virtual existence, you know, like those projects are not built, but that does not mean they are not architecture. And the students understand that and we want them to be able to look at them and to talk about them and to think about them to the extent that they believe they built those projects. They know everything about them. They have been inside those houses, even if those houses were just paper and drawings and virtual creations. So that's what matters the most to us, I think, that the students learn to love whatever they, it is they are doing uh, with us. I think that, you know, the tools you use define the product you produce. So I find it very hard to eat soup with a fork. And the more technology you create, and by technology I don't necessarily mean computers, I mean information and understanding of how to use that information, um, the more things you can do. I dare to say that the building CISA builds today without a computer would not be the same. This does not mean that it needs the computer to think, but it needs the computer to produce. And we go back to architecture being also um, an industry and it requires production and so on and so forth. So, But to answer your question on the conceptual level, what we teach our students to do is to understand that whatever drawing they want to do is okay, be it hand drawing, computer drawing, model, model photo, 3D render, good render, bad render, realistic render, collage, Photoshop, AutoCAD, AutoCAD, Illustrator, Illustrator in design. And you understand that uh, the student becomes a kind of uh, the guy that plays seven instruments, you know. But first of all, he's leading an orchestra of the seven instruments he's going to play after. So the tool itself should not be a limitation and we should never forbid a tool to a student. Quite the opposite. We should promote that they experiment with everything. But they need to understand that the tool is going to help them to produce and to, and to read because the tool is both uh, production, but it's also a lens that allows you, you know, looking at a project from a plan or from a model, it's very different. And the student should use those tools to enrich its discourse, its experimentation, and its learning as a consequence. So I would say that the most important thing that I do with the students is to discuss architecture and to draw architecture. And drawing architecture with them can be many things, from, you know, if you don't know how to do 3Ds, then do a perspective in AutoCAD with lines, like as you know, the guys from Renaissance were doing. It's the same technology, you just have a mouse instead of a feather with ink, you know, it's exactly the same thing as an orchestra guy goes. And if they understand that, then everything is going to be okay. I think they, they, if they love what they do, and if they understand that the drawing is a way of communication, and they are communicating with each other, they are communicating with me in class, with the other classmates, and then with the world when they share their work, be it on social media or on an exhibition or on a conference, it doesn't matter. It's all about communication. So we go back to what I said before. Those buildings are not going to be built, but we can all learn from them the same way we learned from the houses that Chinohara demolished 40 years ago. To be a young architect in Portugal, I can only talk about the time when we were. And we were young architects in 2013, 14, 15, 16. Um, and at that time, we were, again, lucky enough to catch quite a peculiar moment because it was right after a big crisis. There was a lot of work, a lot of uh, tourists in, investing in Lisbon and uh, people getting golden visas and small private clients wanting to buy a house to renovate and sell. I mean, there, there was a... There was a moment because the real estate market went so low that suddenly there was an opportunity. And that opportunity led us to have the chance of experimenting, of tackling uh, projects that in normal conditions we would take a few years to get and we were getting them right away. To have similar typologies at the same time, which meant we could explore different solutions in each of them at the same time. To have um, the opportunity to, to, to create a kind of language of our own architecture, to set tropes and themes and obsessions that we would like to explore in all projects or that we would try to explore often in several projects. And 
to us to be a young architect was, in a way, I, I, it's, it's a strange word, but it was kind of easy because there was a platform, there was an opportunity. And we are yes people, so when, when, when the opportunity shows up, we say yes. We, I mean, we did projects in conditions that are completely unthinkable. So to go to the second side, let's say, to the other side of your question, I mean, we got paid very little, no one respects our work. I mean, not at the time and today, it's, it's a constant, it didn't change yet. Um, we work with the people that did not want to work with us. We work with the people that wanted a young, flexible, cheap architect, and that's where we show up. But at the time, I would say, and even today, money was not the topic. We wanted to build. We wanted to, you know, the same motivation that led us to have a practice. When this opportunity came, you know, what really matters is we're going to build, we're going to try, we're going to understand how a brick goes on top of another brick, and we're going to define spaces, and we're going to create a narrative, and, you know, all of these things are going to exist. And, and they did, and they did. And today we have a more complex understanding of the situation because um, our country believes that an architect that is 50 years old is still a young architect. That's when you should start beginning your actual career. We are still 16 to 18 years away from that and we already have a career. So we are in a strange position because socially our clients are the, the ones that normally would not hire an architect and the ones that want an architect don't want us. So we are in a, in a funny, funny limbo and we make the most out of it. It's a condition that has to be explored that has to be, as I said, like the school bent in our advantage. And I, I, I'm trying to sell it as from a positive perspective. It of course has a lot of downsides also, but it's, uh, I don't know at what point you stop being a young architect. And I don't know if the Portuguese definition even fits for this criteria, but it has been a great opportunity for us to be young and naive um, sometimes even cynical of our own condition and to just let it go and see where it leads us. We are very often told that we are too Portuguese for abroad but not Portuguese enough in Portugal, which is uh, again a very comfortable position, you know, like you can push your own location in the spectrum depending on where you want to go. And I think that the Portuguese client and the figure of the client has to be addressed because if we build a building, it's because someone commissioned us to do it. And so far, all the commissions we had, they were private commissions. So we don't understand yet the public work. So we do private, small scale, most of the times residential projects. So this creates a frame around our production that should not be uh, generalized to everything we might do in the future. But so far, I can say that uh, small scale private client from Portugal is a very traditional figure. It's a figure that wants exactly what he had before, but uh, being him to build it. It's a figure that wants to perpetuate the typology that he had at his parents' houses. It's a figure that wants to have the same materials that his sister-in-law has in, his, in her kitchen. It's someone that cannot speculate on the possibility of generating something new, something that does not exist already. It's someone that needs a comfort zone that he understands already when the project kicks in. So we are hired not to invent, and architects don't invent anything, but we are not hired with the motivation of providing something new, providing the best answer. We are hired to echo the answer he already knows. So. This is quite upsetting sometimes, but it's also true that because they don't know what they want, at the same time, there's a, there's a space, there's a, there's a break, there's a crack where we can go in and somehow open it a bit further and create a space for our work to, to exist. So many times our condition with this society to which we produce all our work is one of um, how can I say this? Uh, half words, you know, let's not say everything. Let's go in between the drops of rain and push for things to happen in a way that if we, if we say everything in the first date, there's no second date anymore. And I think that we have been achieving a lot of our
projects in that kind of weird um, miscommunication sometimes. Um, because at the end, the client likes the project. At the end, the client is fascinated with the work and even thinks everything that happened, it's because that's exactly what he always wanted. And I think that that's where our merit is, to have someone working with us for one, two, three years, designing the project we believe makes sense, having the client being happy in the end, but believing that it was him all along that guided the process. And unfortunately, it should not be like that. It should be very different from this, but we are okay with that. We are okay if this is, if this is what we have to do, we will do it, or we will continue doing it, because we have been doing it for almost a decade now. It seems contradictory if I say that I don't care about the building, but that I need the building. So the building brings credibility. You know, if you do a project and you don't build it, it is still architecture, but it's lacking. You know, it's lacking that extra 1%. And when you build, you document, you photograph, you explore the building in a different way. It's like a one-to-one -one model. It's a big, big, big model. But it's still just another representation of the project, because the project, as I said, it was already there. And I think that the construction validates you to a certain extent. You know, if you build, it gives you kind of credibility. And some people might say that it's the final goal is to build a building. I would say the building happens in the middle of the process. So when you finish the building, you are halfway through. Because from this point onwards, now you have the documentation that allows you to share it with the world. And what I could say is that building is fundamental, but if the building is demolished the day after, it's perfectly fine. Because it proved its point, and very probably from now on, it's only going to get worse. You know, clients are going to move in, they choose bad furniture, they're going to paint walls, they're going to change things. I mean, it's their house. It's their right to do so. But to us, I think the building dies in the day, in the day we kind of deliver it. Like, this is, this is it. Now it's not, our, it's not ours anymore. Until that point, it is ours. The most difficult thing to us is to go out of the bubble of private commissions. It's very difficult because you can keep getting hundreds of them in the next few years. You can build 100 houses. You can renovate 100 buildings. You can, you know, this is infinite. But it's very difficult to go out of that and to build a museum or a school or, you know, to do anything public. Anything that matters in the other league, in the other scale. And to ask your second question, what we want to do after, we want to do that. We want to jump to that scale. We want to be able to, we don't want to stop doing what we do now. Because designing houses, the single family house, the detached single family house, is still the most interesting architectural laboratory on the planet and the proof is that we are all after all of these centuries still designing new and new houses and trying to and being surprised every day by something new we see and that you know takes us out of our comfort zone and makes us wonder what if we try this you know like so the house has that but public buildings they also have it and they have that extra um one percent that is the fact that they are public so what i said before about the houses i don't know if i would say it about a school I think if we were to build a school, it would be very important for us to document it and to share it with the world. But I think the way how the school would be used along the years matters a bit more than the way how a house is used along the years. So I would not probably be so comfortable demolishing a school right after we built it.